today. The Leadership Development Committee looked at all the pros and cons and felt that the easiest and simplest thing to do was ask anyone who's on a landline or a phone that does not have Zoom on it to simply unmute themselves and vote. And if you remember, if we were all together in the sanctuary, there'd be no privacy. We would know whether anyone was voting pro or con. So there's nothing secret about this kind of a ballot. And we want to test the same way we did last year. So in about one minute, Jane's going to put up a slide and we will ask you to vote. So we know that you are hearing us and that you know how to vote because you don't just check yes or no, yay or nay, you are also having to submit your vote. Jane, would you kindly put the poll up? Is that good? Looks like a few people are having trouble with their sound, but. If someone is having trouble with the sound, would you kindly unmute yourself right now and tell us? Oh, I don't know if they can. Hold on. Okay. If you can't hear, you can unmute yourself and tell us so. I could hear you, but the uh, the, the uh, window wasn't open long enough for me to click submit. Okay. So I don't know what it defaults to, uh, yes or no or nothing. Concerned about a few people who said they could not hear. They can't, they can't hear you in order to tell you that they can't hear. <laughs> True. I can hear now. I was just connected the wrong way before. Excellent. I do see a hand raise, um, Donna and um, Jane. No, I do not. Jeff Kinsett, Kinsett has his hand raised. I just wanted to make you aware that I had the same problem Walter had. Uh, I thought I clicked rather quickly, but when I clicked, uh, I received a message that said the poll was already closed. So I could leave that open a little bit longer that would be appreciated. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Jane, when we put it up next time, let's leave it up a little longer to make certain that everyone has an opportunity to read through it, then click, and then go to the submit button. OK. Thank you. All right, we're not hearing from anyone else. I'm hoping that most of them were having simple problems like Cindy did, who said she was able to correct it and is now able to hear. So I'm going to proceed now and read the BUC covenant. As part of this beloved BUC community, I promise to strive to be my best self in all my interactions, assume the best intentions of everyone's actions, be mindful of our shared humanity in my communications, 
pause, reflect, and be part of the solution when things go awry. Thus do we covenant with one another. Now I'm going to call on Teresa for the invocation and chalice lighting. In the name of all who are gathered here as part of this beloved community, let us be grateful for the many things that we have done during this pandemic year to reach out and support one another. May we be present with open and joyful hearts for the work that we do today, so essential to the life of this church. And may we share hope for the coming year. Amen and blessed be. Thank you, Teresa. And I believe we have a quorum and you can confirm that Craig. Yes, I confirm that. Fine, then we can move on. Meeting covenant and rules of procedure. We've already talked about Zoom, but for those who joined after the opening words, we are not using the buddy system this year. So if you're on a landline or some type of mobile phone that does not have Zoom, when we get to vote on a motion, we will ask you to unmute yourselves and vote verbally. Remembering that if we were doing this in our sanctuary, we would be seeing how everyone votes. So there's no privacy issues to be concerned about here. Jane will put up the Zoom poll and based on our test, she's going to leave it up a little longer so that you have the opportunity to read. So are these the um, motion? Which motion are we using? Well, you've put up the results of the initial Zoom poll, can you hear me? Yes. Which so one? everyone knows that we have 5% who said they could not hear. So which poll do we want now? No poll yet. Okay. No poll right now. Sorry. As soon as I'm finished. Sorry. And Craig comes up, we'll have another one. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, um, Jane will take a picture of each of the Zoom polls. That again is something we learned last year from a legal perspective that we need to do. It may sound odd, but this is Michigan, so we have a few oddities here. We try to abide by our constitution and Robert's rules of order. Keith Ensroth will function as parliamentarian today and here's that little book. And I want to mention something that I shared with other folks in the practice session. Our denomination and our district are looking carefully at Robert's rules because it's been called to everyone's attention that there are some underpinnings of white supremacy that are inherent in Robert's rules. I don't fully understand all of it myself at this point. We're not suggesting that we will ditch them. Rather, we will study them. We will begin to understand what people are telling us for the future. That's basically what we will be doing today. The only other change in the agenda that you will see is when we get to the reports, we will cover all reports in total before I open the floor for questions. We're trying to be a little more efficient this year and not have a meeting that runs over three hours. It was a challenge last year. I think Bruce and crew did a great job. Nonetheless, it's up to us to try and do a little better this year. And that's what we're trying for. First item on the agenda then is the motion to proceed. 
So I will call on Craig for that. Thank you, Donna. So a communication was sent uh, to all the congregants on May 3rd, informing them of an error on the board's part in preparation for this meeting. The error had to do with timing for sending nominations from the congregation. Uh, not, I'm sorry, timing for sending nomination notification of the candidates who are running for election and also allowing adequate time for additional nominations from the congregation beyond those identified by the LDC. Notification should have been sent 21 days prior to this meeting date, but was actually sent four days later than that. The communication on May 3rd also mentioned that the board will be reviewing our constitution during the next year, particularly the two sections that caused the confusion that led to this error. And we will propose appropriate constitutional amendments to address any areas of concern. The board regrets this oversight, but we believe it's in the best interest of BUC to stick with the original meeting date, so we did not change the date of this meeting. In light of this, I wish to propose the following motion, which was also mentioned in the May 3rd communication. Donna, would you like me to read the motion? Yes. Jane, would you post it for everyone to see, please? Whereas Article 11, Paragraph 3 of the BUC Constitution states that the list of nominations be published three Sundays, 21 days before the annual meeting, and whereas the list of nominations was published 17 days before the annual meeting, I move that Article 11, Paragraph 3 be waived for purposes of the May 16th, 2021 BUC Annual Meeting only to allow the nomination and election of officers, trustees, stewardship committee, and members, members of the Leadership Development Committee whose nomination was not timely published. Are there any questions or concerns? Madam President. Yes. I would like to second the motion. Thank you, Jeff. Jane, would you kindly take it down so I can see if the hands are being raised? Thank you. I'm not seeing any hands being raised. No, I do see one. Uh, Ray McCarris and Rich Shrek. I believe have their hands raised. They can unmute themselves. Rich, if you could unmute. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay, I think we're going to put a poll up for this so that everyone can vote. Is that right, Donna? Yes. And since no other hands seem to be going up, thank you, Jane. Donna, this is Kathy Doohy. Nancy Duffy has her hand up. Kathy? Yes. Um, yes, Nancy no, has her hand up. Yeah, Nancy Duffy. Nancy, you can unmute yourself. Okay, Cindy raised her hand. Cindy? Cindy will need to unmute as well. Um, okay. 
I'm relaunching the poll. I got a message that it was uh, closed. I did not close it. Cindy, we've seen your hand up, but we're not hearing you. Did you unmute yourself? Not able to, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. um, do we have the chat enabled? Would she be able to? Send Cindy is um, very able. She launches okay. a lot of meetings. I think it she's was, telling us she's right. not. It was, it was not. Hand. Okay, it was not allowing me to unmute. I'm sorry, but now it allowed me to unmute because the host allowed it. But um, but the only reason I raised my hand was because of the poll being closed too early, but hopefully I got mine in now. There, Thank you. There's some questions about if the poll limits how many, but I have 50 accepts and zero not accepts. And we have 74 in the session. 51 have accepted. If you voted during the first um, poll, please re-vote. Fifty-three. And remember that those of us who are co-hosts are not able to vote. I believe we have the required number of votes. So, um, Sounds sure like we, we do. Based on 74 being here, yes, yes, we do. So I'll end polling now? Yes. Thanks, Jane. Picture. Okay. Thank you. We're going to move into service and leadership recognition. I'm hoping that Stephen Deering is here and that he will be able to present for music. Donna? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, do you want to do the minutes first or did you want to do the awards? Um, and then the minutes? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I lost my agenda place. Yes, we are actually doing the approval of the minutes from the prior annual meeting. Thank you, Craig, for the reminder. Sure. So would you like to put the motion on the floor? I would love that. I move that we accept the minutes of the 2020 annual meeting held on June 16, 2020. And a second. I'll second it. Thank you. The poll's up and everyone but the co-hosts is able to vote. If you're on your phone, you can unmute yourself and vote verbally. Donna, I don't know if you can read those tiny, faint I numbers. can't. <laughs> we have 57 have accepted, zero have not. All I right. I think we can move. Then yep. we passed. I got to take another picture now. All right. 
I'm not certain if Stephen is with us. Yes, he is. Okay, Stephen Deering, you're up. All right. So thank this... you, thank you, Donna, and thank you. Um, I guess I'll Jane. Pass up. No. <laughs> All right. So this year's service and leadership recognition for music goes to the one and only Keith Endroth. <laughs> He has chaired the music committee for the past two years, demonstrating excellence in leadership with love and support to our ministry. Keith has also served as a cantor and has helped coordinate fellow leaders, fellow song leaders, allowing them to share their talents. Thanks, to Keith, for sharing your passion for music at BUC. Yay, Keith. Thank you, Stephen. And of course, Keith. Craig, you're up. All right. I have uh, the first award is the Board of Trustees Award. This award is going to Richard Shrek, uh, Chair of the Plan Giving Committee. Rich has served on the Plan Giving Committee, which oversees BUC's three endowment funds for several years. And during the last fiscal year, he oversaw the transition to a new external advisor for the funds saving on advisory fees, and also worked with the board and our investment advisor to update the investment policy for the endowment funds. Thank you, Rich, for all your years of service leading to this, leading this important committee. Yeah. All right, that was in, uh, that award was in my role as uh, on the board of trustees. And now I will present two awards um, on behalf of Reverend Mandy. The first is the Executives Award. To Diane Slon, our treasurer, Diane worked diligently to create an endowment policy to clarify how BUC's three endowments should be used. This process involved researching the history of the endowments and working with other lay leaders who currently oversee the usage of those funds. Diane's good work will serve our congregation for years to come. Thank you, Diane. The next award is the Minister's Award, again from Reverend Mandy. This award goes to Drika DeGraff, Jane O'Neill, and Mary Jo Ebert. These three took turns as Zoom greeters or bouncers every Sunday morning during the program year. They also served as substitute Zoom hosts one Sunday a month. Each of them have also taken time to train fellow congregants on how to use Zoom. Through this work, they played a pivotal role in our success as an online congregation. Thank you very much, Drika, Jane, and Mary Jo. Thank you, Craig. And thank you to all of those of you who were recognized. You've done an extraordinary job during extraordinary times. We appreciate and value every one of you immensely. Now I'd like to ask Richard Shrek to give a brief report from the planned giving. Okay, being very brief this time, let me just say that uh... We have switched advisors. It seems to work very well. In the first quarter of this year, we've already regained the money we paid out in last year's uh, uh, percentage payouts from the funds. And uh, it seems that they're doing quite well going into the next year. I won't go into detail at this time. I will say also that the Community Foundation endowment is also growing and we expect it to continue to grow over the next three years due to a recent large donation by one of our members. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. It's nice to hear that positive bit of news. The Leadership Development Committee report, Kathy Duhame. Hi, this is Kathy. Um, I am this year's chair of the Leadership Development Committee. Uh, the LDC's main challenge this fiscal year was, as has been for everybody, was meeting via Zoom. But even without face-to-face -face interaction, the committee worked extremely well together. The LDC spent the first half of the fiscal year creating a new procedures document utilizing information from previous LDCs, 
the BUC board and the UUA, as well as the invaluable input from Reverend Mandy. Our hope is that this living document can be used to provide continuity for years to come. The BUC board also provided job descriptions, which were very, very helpful. Uh, the LDC is charged, as many of you know, with identifying recruiting nominees for the board stewardship committee and the LDC itself. Yearly rotation this year required nominees for board officers, one incoming board trustee and two incoming stewardship committee members along with nine LDC nominees, five of whom will be elected. We found very capable candidates for all of these positions who we feel, feel will provide BUC with strong leadership and dedicated service. Thank you to all the candidates for their willingness to serve our church. I would also like to express my deep gratitude to all the, of this year's members of the LDC. It was a great group and it has been a privilege to work with all of you. Finishing their terms are Judy Amir, Camille Harris, Izzy Capoya, and Barbara Wolf, as well as Natalie Price, who is completing the term of a member who exited the committee after their first year. Continuing on the committee next year are Tony Kubian, Peter Schreck, Chris Slon, and Jane O'Neill, who was voted by the LDC committee to be the chair in the next fiscal year. Thanks again to everyone. Thank you, Kathy. Great job. <clears throat> and now, Treasurer's Report, Diane Slon. Okay, and I am going to share my screen. <clears throat> I actually have a little bit of a presentation and I'll try to be as quick as possible. So am I sharing? Uh, there we go. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. Can I get some nods? Great, okay. All right, well, um, first of all, um, thank you all. And um, this afternoon, I'm gonna talk a little bit about BUC's finances. I'm gonna, as I said, try to go through these as quickly as possible, but I um, wanted to show you first this pie chart. This first slide shows you the annual um, income. These are the major revenue sources for our budget for this current fiscal year that we're in now. And as you remember, our fiscal year starts in July. So we're now talking about fiscal year 2021 and we're about nine months into it. So these are our major, revenue categories. Um, our budgeted revenue for this year was 679,000. Um, and the, pretty much the major, and this is the case every year, the major source of revenue are pledges. It's about three quarters of our revenue. Um, and then um, the, the other sources are including rentals, uh, community foundation, foundation and general endowment income, which Rich, Rich just talked about, fundraising and rummage, and then designated and uh, other expenses. The designated expenses are those where there's, there's um, some um, all, uh, call on the, that money already. So um, those, those are the major fundraising budgeted ex, um, income for this year sources. And then the budgeted expenses for this year um, were uh, this, the seven major categories are the office and facility staff that comes in as, at about a third. Minister expenses, which includes the housing and salary and benefits. RE staff, office and facilities expenses, which is just about everything that you really, um, all the expenses that go into running uh, the, the organization in the building. Music staff at about 11%. Interest in mortgage at about 47,000 um, and 7% 7 of our, our expenses and then all other. So again, this is what was um, budgeted for this current year. And we, uh, what was approved last year by the board was a deficit budget of about $9,000. So that's how we started the year with looking at a deficit budget. What I wanna do now is talk to you a little bit about the impact of COVID on our budget. And this is, this is important because it's really modified a lot of how we're um, looking at things. So going into fiscal year 2021, we knew that the pandemic would really continue to have uh, a considerable impact on our budget, especially on our revenue. And there were several revenue items that we anticipated would decrease significantly because of the lack of in-person activities. And so in particular, you can see the chart at the top of this slide shows the three major revenue sources that, um, that changed in, in the budget from last fiscal year. So what I've tried to do is show you um, how the, this was, but they were budgeted for previous fiscal year, and that would be 19 and 20, and then this fiscal year. So rentals, for example, um, previous year was budgeted coming in at around 114,000, and it did. 
Um, but we knew because of lack of in, you know, because of the pandemic that we needed to budget very conservatively. So we budgeted that down by about 55%. And um, nine months into the year, it's coming in fairly well, but rentals are doing fairly well, but it's still slightly under budget. Fundraising and rummage, you know, we had really hoped to hold a few small fundraising events and um, at least one online rummage. We were going to try that out. But unfortunately, again, because of the pandemic, we weren't able to hold any of those events. So no revenue for that line item. And then finally, plate collection. Again, we budgeted that down by about 30% because of the lack of in-person um, activities. And actually, um, we've had some good response to the online giving, so that's coming in a little better than budget. So again, when fiscal year 2021, was bud the budget was approved, it was hoped that the pandemic actually would be under control by early 2021 and normal church operations could resume. However, as we all know, that's not the case and the continued shutdown has really impacted our revenue sources more than anticipated. However, the good news is that we've also had lower expenses in some areas. And in particular, we had budgeted for a full-time RE director. Um, but again, due to COVID, this was reduced. We did not need a full-time RE director and this has been um, reduced down to a part-time part coordinator. And we are estimating that at the end of this year, we'll be able to actually save about 38,000 on that expense alone. So great news. So in a nutshell, through nine months of the current fiscal year, projections are that instead of ending the year at actually a $9,000 deficit, we will actually, we're hoping, this is a projection, we're estimating that we'll actually be ending with a $25,000 surplus. And this is a $34,000 positive variance to budget. So, so actually doing quite well. And um, this, is, this is great news. And then finally, one other thing related to COVID, um, as you will recall, last spring, BUC applied for the Paycheck Protection Program or PPP loan through the federal government. And uh, we were approved for a $90,000 loan, which really helped cover the payroll and mortgage costs during the first several months of the pandemic. Um, and about a month ago, a month or so ago, we, we received word through our bank that that has been forgiven in its entirety. So we will not need to pay that loan back. So that's, that's great news too. Um, I wanted to say a few very quick things about the capital campaign. You may have remembered at the beginning of this fiscal year, which started in July, we had about a $93,000 short-term loan, which was related to the Cherish the Flame uh, capital campaign. And that loan was due in February of this year. And um, we had you know, really looked at a couple of different options to pay that off. But the good news is during 2020, um, BUC had a significant unrestricted cash reserves due to the careful management of expenses in the last fiscal year as well as the current fiscal year. And um, that actually was enough to actually pay off the loan. So in October, the board um, approved using the excess cash reserves um, to pay off that loan. So not only do we now not have that loan, but we actually save about 350 on interest um, every month. So that's, that's great news as well. Okay, and then I'm gonna talk just lastly about the forecast for the 20, um, 2021 budget. So our revenues, again, this is not finalized uh, and it's not uh, approved yet, but what's, what it's looking like is our, our revenues will be about 690,000, which is a little uh, slightly up from last year or this year rather. Our expenses will come in around 730,000, which is about a 6% increase. And what this means is our net income right now, we're looking at a negative 40,000 or $40,000 deficit budget. But let me tell you a little bit about the highlights of the budget so you see where these numbers are coming from. Um, first off, uh, you know, based on the stewardship campaign's current numbers, pledges are anticipated to de decrease by about $25,000. Um, you know, unfortunately, right now we are still waiting on a number of pledge units to respond to the campaign. And um, so we're really not sure what the final numbers would be. And actually, because we don't, you know, have those responses yet, as you can imagine, it's a little difficult to budget when you're not sure what your major source of revenue is actually going to wind up being. Uh, but we do at this point, we're going to be conservative and say it's going to decrease by about 25,000. Um, rentals, fundraisers, and rummage are all budgeted to increase modestly, but um, still budgeted conservatively to be well below pre pandemic levels. And then um, on the expense side, some of the things that are actually ramping up a little bit, our plate distribution is going to go back to 50% of the, of the um, collections. It had been down, but in previous years, it's always been at 50%. So we think that's really important. Um, our RE director, we have hired uh, Nico as a full-time RE director, which is fantastic. And then um, health insurance premiums, something else related to COVID have increased. We've just been notified they've been increased by 10% starting in July. So no surprise there, but um, all of these are the expenses that um, 
that um, are good, but they, they put us in the position we're in. So um, how are we gonna close the gap? We have a couple of different options. Uh, there are uh, additional rental opportunities that are in the works that could bring us another 20 to $25,000 that's currently not anticipated in the budget. We continue to have excess unrestricted cash beyond the monthly reserves that we always keep there for, for um, un, unforeseen incidents. So that's good. And then, as I mentioned a few slides back, we have a surplus from, we're hoping, actually we're hoping to take it to the bank, but we are hoping to um, have a surplus from this fiscal year. So all of those opportunities are there and I think we're gonna find a way to cover that um, deficit. Um, and then, you know, I think the last statement on the slide is really important to keep in mind. Um, when you think about it, there will really be two or even over two years, fiscal years that have been or will be significantly impacted by the pandemic. And over those two years, we're really looking at a surplus in one year, which is this year, and a deficit in the other year, which I think is, as you can see, next year. So it's important to look at both those years together and acknowledge that despite the fiscal curveballs that have been thrown at us from the pandemic or due to the pandemic, we will, when you combine those years together, we'll probably wind up at pretty much of a close uh, break-even position, which is which is great news. So, so again, I want to say thank you to the staff, um, uh, Valerie and um, um, Joanne have been fantastic to work with, and they've done a great job in uh, managing expenses along with Reverend Mandy. So, you know, just wanted to thank everyone for that. And then last, how can you help? Um, if you have not yet uh, submitted your annual pledge for the stewardship campaign, please do call the office and um, let us know what you plan to do for next year, because that'll really help us in terms of budgeting. And then I, I just you know, uh, I wrote a few of these um, other opportunities that at no expense or really little expense to you at no cost, you can really help the um, church. So again, the Kroger Community Rewards Program, Scrip and Amazon Smile. So again, call the office if you wanna know more about these, but these are all great ways that you can help BUC. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Diane. I think that was quite comprehensive. This church year, we expected to spend time developing a new strategic plan, but gave priority to managing the pandemic crisis. This necessitated increasing the frequency of our meetings from once a month to twice a month. We also developed a new board covenant. Perhaps the most notable change the board made this past year was the decision to set aside the Carver model of policy governance and move to the Hotchkiss model, which is specifically designed for churches. To enable us to better understand Hotchkiss, the board added training sessions to our regular meetings. We have arranged for the Reverend Dan Hotchkiss to lead us in creating a governance document after the new board is elected. When completed, we will be in a far better position to develop a new strategic plan. Early in the church year, the board voted unanimously to approve only a balanced budget. So we are in the midst of a conundrum due to a projected deficit. We anticipate residual dollars and another small fundraiser as Diane indicated will make up the difference. The budget is not what we wanted or expected. The board wants the congregation to know that while we will likely be fine this year, the following year is highly problematic because we anticipate no residual dollars. At my weekly leaders Zoom, I hear the same thing from most presidents, that is a shortfall in pledges. We had a truly upbeat and creative stewardship canvas this year. We should thank all of those involved because they did a wonderful job. Our district, yes, thank you. Our district has said, if there was ever a time to borrow from your endowment, now is the time. We will not have to do that this year, but next year is a very different matter. I inquired about reluctant contributors to the annual pledge at my weekly leader Zoom and learned that while there are obviously always some stragglers, we have more than most. One month, one full month after the end of the pledge canvas, one fifth 
20% of our congregation had failed to even reply. That is more than most churches have. We need to understand why. The board continues to appreciate and support work being done on the racial and environmental justice fronts. We are proud of the work done by the worship committee, worship associates, and our co-directors of music ministry to bring consistently good online services. We value the work they are doing also to ensure that we can offer both in-person and online services at some point in the future. So about that point in the future, our reopening task force is exploring all options and investigating the possibility, emphasis on possible, reopening before January 22. Currently, our denomination and our district are recommending January 2022. The key to reopening is ensuring we exclude no one. The task force has invited Nico Van Ostrand to join us at our next meeting. Jim Shettle and crew are working on all elements of our HVAC systems and have installed improvements in a couple of classrooms. There seem to be hundreds of things to learn and consider before reopening. That may sound like hyperbole, but it is close to reality. The board reviewed and supported the work of the BUC Carbon Footprint Project. We discussed and strongly supported parental leave for Reverend Mandy, and some board members attended the National New Day Rising Conference, which helped to further educate ourselves on racial justice and indigenous people's justice. And if you were there, you know, there were hundreds of people all across the country that attended that conference. We continue to work closely with the Leadership Development Committee, LDC, and provided them, as Kathy mentioned, with job descriptions for all board members, which is more comprehensive than described in our constitution. The board wants to thank our amazing staff for all they do. We rely on them every single day. We have seen positive changes in our religious education program. We want to thank Reverend Mandy in particular for her excellent leadership and help in growing our faith. We want to thank all the committee chairs for their time, talent, and leadership. Last but not least, I want to personally thank all members of the board for their dedication and willingness to work far more than they expected. Last year, Bruce Weber closed his report by saying, quote, we now have the opportunity to reevaluate our lives and the world we live in. The old normal was broken. I encourage you to step up and create a better world, end quote. I love those words. Yes, the old norm was broken, is broken. We do need to step up and create the world we want. Yes, we can together, all of us. Thank you. Now, before we get to the election results, I'm going to open up the floor for any questions, concerns, issues any of you may have. I think Ray has his hand up. Go ahead, Ray. Ray, if you're able to unmute. I see you have uh, uh, rummage in the, in the uh, plans. Is that correct that we will have a rummage sale because I've got all my stuff keeps piling, piling, piling. And I got to get rid of it. <laughs> Spring 2022. Okay. I can hold out. <laughs> Fingers crossed, right?
Craig, do you see any other hands up? Sarah, I don't. I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, Sarah. Hi. I just wanted to quickly mention um, another le uh, service and leadership award from Religious Education. Um, the Religious Education Award um, goes to Michelle Chapman. Uh, Michelle Chapman is the Building Bridges Advisor, and she rose to the challenge of leading the sixth and seventh grade curriculum, Building Bridges, in an entirely virtual format. Her leadership, wisdom, and communication with families ensured the program ran smoothly for BUC's youth. Additionally, Michelle was a grounding force and a source of institutional memory and fill-in chair of the RE Council, helping reimagine our RE program online. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. And we're sorry it wasn't included with the others. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. I don't think I see any other hands, Anna. I'm up, oh, yeah, we did Larry Larson. Yeah, I'm wondering if uh, the congregation supports uh, a process of learning about the proposed eighth principle. Uh, there's quite a few congregations that have accepted this formally. And uh, some are hoping that there'll be maybe a hundred congregations or more before the uh, UUA gets to vote on it. But the question, is, but the question is, should we as a congregation support learning about this Eighth, eighth Amendment? I believe we are but, supporting yeah. it right now. If anyone read the current newsletter, they saw all of the statements by our entire staff and my piece was also addressed on that. And to follow up, we have an amazing racial justice team under the leadership of Mary Jo Ebert. And they have numerous programs and sessions planned so that people can learn more about the eighth principle. I will also mention that our youth stepped up before the adults did and got actively involved with the eighth principle. So check out your newsletter and you'll see where we're going with the eighth principle. Anyone else? Cindy. Oh, I just wanted to um... Uh, mentioned that um, I just drove by a church that's just a few blocks from my house and they're starting their services inside this Sunday or today at 10 a.m. And I encourage the, uh, the committee that is looking at the reopening to uh, think of ways to, even if you don't, if you want to wait until January, think of ways to incrementally uh, find way more ways for the PUC to meet in the building as a congregation because I'm I'm sure I'm afraid that the reason uh, pledges are down the you know uh, has something to do with that I mean our services are nice but they're not the same as being together as a community I think Donna once called it the golden thread that holds us together. There's something to be said to all of us singing a hymn together uh, versus just hearing one person sing it over a tinny Zoom uh, speaker on my little smartphone. <laughs> but anyway, I, that's my uh, wish that they, uh, well, my concern, it's, it's, it's more concern for BUC to lose membership because of waiting so long to reopen the building. And I'm sorry, that wasn't a question. It was just my, my input. Thank you for listening. And thank you, Cindy, for sharing your thoughts. We don't have a committee. We have a reopening task force. 
And I believe they are looking across the spectrum at just about anything and everything. I can share one thing with you. Uh, at my weekly leader Zoom, it's normally chaired by the Reverend Dr. Lisa Presley. But when she was gone, Reverend David was in her place and he happens to be an army chaplain and he meets with all the chaplains. And he said that in the military, a lot of them have already opened up their services. But he said, as you might imagine, when they're given rules in the military, <laughs> they tend to abide by them reasonably well. But he did observe that even in the military, when he went to a couple of services, that people were not abiding by the social distancing, the masking, or anything else. So there's a lot to look at. There's a lot to consider. And Cindy's right when she said, because we know pledges fell off as a result of the fact that we're not in our building. That's one element we have to deal with. So trying to look at everything and ensure we don't exclude anyone because there are one or two congregations who have proposed going back to adults only services. And we opted not to take that approach here. So it's all under consideration. I want you to know they're meeting regularly and they're investigating constantly. And when they can come up with an earlier date, I know they will. Thank you for the input, Cindy. Greg, I don't see any other hands, do you? Hey, nope, I don't see any other hands raised at this point. Okay, issues arising for the good of the congregation. That's basically announcements. I know you heard it earlier, but there's going to be a program sponsored by the BUC Humanists at 7 p.m. tonight. And if you're concerned about voting, voting, go to the calendar, click on the link and join that. Any other announcements? I think Kathy will do the results next, right, Donna? Okay, no other announcements. Then, Kathy, you're up for election results. Uh, elected as board president, Donna Larkin Moore. Elected as board vice president, Craig Stroop. Elected as board secretary, Mary Gowell Enzroth. Elected as board treasurer, Diane Slon. Elected to a three year term of Board trustee is Julia Fulver. Elected to a two-year term on the Stewardship Committee, Jan Devereaux and Bruce Weber as co-chairs. Elected to the Leadership Development Committee for two-year terms in no particular order are Amy Smalley, Colleen Cavanaugh, Sean Rooney, Rob Davidson, and Natalie Price. Wow, thank you. And thank you all for making time in your busy days to come to this meeting. Craig, would you like to put a motion on the floor to adjourn? Yes, thank you. I move that we adjourn this meeting. A second? Thank you. Jane, would you put the poll up? We're at 52, 53. 53. That's enough. That's enough. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all. We are hereby adjourned. <laughs>